Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for tuning in to Globespan 24-7. Here we have Globespan is expanding, engaging, embracing, and educating our communities right here in New York, across the Caribbean, the UK, and all other parts of our globe. So this creates the platform for the, for the, um, uh, the three Ds, the dialogue, the debate, and discussion. And many of you have seen uh, some of the programs we've had over the last couple of months. Uh, recently, we've had the CCJ um, event that took place live the last couple of days on Globespan. So we want to thank you for tuning in and allowing us to raise the bar with the Globespan programs. But before we continue, I want to ask everyone, when you, uh, as you're tuning in live with us on Globespan 24-7, please click like and share the page on Facebook. Also, um, if you can go to the YouTube, we also have the YouTube uh, live. Um, you can check that one out for some of you that might not be able to tune in on uh, Facebook. See if you can share that as well for some people um, to help them to um, log in. So I hope that you will continue to jo join us and allow us to expand um, the discussion, the debate, you know, um, and the, the um, dialogue that we are bringing to you live right here uh, on Facebook at Glowspan in New York. In New York. Um, as we continue, let me just say uh, today, today's topic is uh, an important one. And um, as we choose the topics we share with you and our, our audience um, on Facebook, on YouTube, and in audience, we try to bring the subject matters that are important to our communities. And today, um, choosing this, this particular topic uh, that we have, the conversations on race in Guyana, you know, and the journey to healing is extremely important, not just to me, but to all of us here. And these individuals that I will introduce you to, um, we've actually had conversations and we have, I've had conversations with um, people in our audience and some of you who are tuning in with us live. Um, how important this is and to move our nation and our people forward. So today as we open the doorway to healing for our people of Guyana, our nation and, and our audience, those of you tuning in, in studio and online, um, I want to welcome you back again to Globespan 24-7 and don't forget on um, the 19th, May 19th, uh, we'll be moving from the Saturday to Sunday the 19th. So hopefully you, um, more people will be able to tune in with that. So on today's uh, Let the Woman Speak episode, again, we have conversations on race in Guyana, journey to healing. So embracing four individuals here in studio that will um, engage our audience in the first um, globe span courageous conversations, telling the stories as they were told in our history over time and some coming from learning from our ancestors. So I want to welcome Alexis Stevens, who is um, sitting uh, next to me on my right. Next to her is Patia Singh. And then we have Ferlin Pedro. Did I say that right? Yes. Ferlin? Yes. And Anton, um, Anton Craigwell. So let me just share a little highlights of um, these folks that are joining us. Alexis Stevens is actually um, visiting us from Guyana. I want to thank her for um, joining us today in um, bringing a very important topic to the conversation. Alexis, just for an update, is a member of the Sisters of Mercy Institute-led anti-racism and training team uh, since 2009. She's also a uh, commissioner on the Caribbean Central American South American Anti-Racism Commission. Her work is focused specifically on designing, organizing, and faci facilitating an anti-racism tra racism training workshops in Guyana, Argentina, Panama, and the United States of America. The Sister of Mercies of America is an international community of Roman Catholic women. Um, the CCASA is one of the six communities that makes up the Sisters of Mercies of America. And as I say that, um, you'll get to hear from Alexis in terms of how some of that work translates to what she does in Guyana and, and across the globe. So next to her, we have the um, Pratia, Pratia Singh who is the founding director of Rajkumari Culture Center. For those of you living in New York who is aware of the Raj, Rajkumari Culture Center that has a long history with New York. And um, I just want to share a bit about Patia. 
She is, uh, has pioneered and in instituted um, several programs critical to the in Indo-Caribbean community she serves and the wider New York um, environment. Uh, as director of the Rajkumari, she utilizes all her skills, knowledge, and experience to create a vibrant cultural and artistic organization that continues to be the vanguard of cultural renaissance to revive and revitalize in the Caribbean art and culture and to preserve, present, and institutionalize these arts here in the United States. And this just goes to show you how important, even in the arts, um, that can, can transform to the conversation on race in Guyana. So we'll hear from Tia uh, uh, about that. Also, we have, um, this is not just let the women speak. The men will speak as well. <laughs> so um, we have a very important person in my space, um, uh, my partner um, and good friend, Anton Craigwell, uh, who is the founder and president and CEO of DBGM. He actually comes with a background uh, from journalism and there's so much on him, but I, I'm going to just highlight, if you don't mind, Anton, you can um, fill in what I miss out, right? Is that okay? Okay. Um, he actually produced a documentary, You're Not Alone, and actually the documentary has been um, traveling uh, across the U.S. and um, other parts of the Caribbean and, uh, it, and facilitates discussions for on depression on black gay men. In 2013, he founded DGBM a nonprofit organization committed to raising awareness of the underlying factors contributing to depression and suicidal ideation in black gay men, including tra contracting HIV. And DGBM is an organization based here in New York. Um, Anton is also a certified national mental health first aid instructor. And um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get him to do uh, a mental health piece in the um, upcoming episodes. He also hosts an uh, uh, in mind um, conference, a mental health conference that uh, it's been three years? Five years, Five years now. I um, was fortunate to attend one of them in New York, and um, it's actually coming up again in October. So if any of you are interested, um, we will share that um, in a future uh, episode of when that is scheduled. But you can find DGBM on Facebook and uh, follow some of the work that they're doing. Ferlin. Um, our handsome young man here, uh, um, Ferlin is a postgraduate student in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he's a frequent public commentator on po politics and human rights issues in Guyana, and you could follow him on his Facebook page as well. And that's what caught my attention uh, in inviting him um, as part of this uh, conversation here today. Um, he hopes to inspire and change the prevailing ethnic-centered um, discourse in Guyana in favor of a more inclusive approach through solidarity and understanding. And I believe, Farlin, you have a blog also, right? So yeah. you'll tell, tell us about the blog um, so people could follow that as well. So uh, each individual comes in with uh, a framework. Um, these are their opinions. So um, we will share that with you and we will open the conversation. And as we open the conversation, I'm asking that um, we include an open dialogue uh, within those of you who are tuning in uh, at your homes, um, you know, on your phones, uh, in your cars, wherever you're at, in our studio. Open the dialogue that, because this is a very important and critical conversation, especially as Guyana approaches um, election, whether it's coming in the coming months or, or 2020. So. I want for us to keep that in mind and um, encourage our um, children as well as this conversation continues. So tomorrow we all know that it's Mother's Day and it's celebrated tomorrow. So as we celebrate Mother's Day tomorrow, I was actually thinking that um, if we all can lift up our female ancestors who journeyed with their partners and spouses to Guyana from Africa and India and parts of India, uh, let's show them that today, despite their struggles, we honor them in spirit. I dedicate this episode today to our ancestors, our mothers, our mothers, um, our mother's mother, her mother, and so on. I also dedicate today um, for a little girl, my niece, uh, Shivana, who is not here right now. I think she's on her way. I wanted her to hear the stories of where, um, where an, uh, our ancestors come from and hopefully let the stories impact the adult that she will become. So to all the little girls 
out there and mothers, you know, um, celebrating Mother's Day, uh, please take the time to maybe, if not share some of this, to um, include that conversation and um, encouraging them, especially the children who are born here um, from Guyanese parentage. And um, so, so they know the stories because so many of us um, have missed some of that stories. So as we continue, um, I'm just going to uh, go around and ask uh, uh, each of our guests to kind of like highlight, you know, um, about this particular topic and coming here today. What does it mean to you? Well, I think it's a timely conversation. Um, I often say that the conversation around race is what I call a courageous conversation for those people who are really willing um, to enter into this conversation. Um, I say it's courageous because there is a tendency in Guyana to um, downplay our racial differences. Um, too often, you'll hear people say, oh, we don't have a race problem. It only surfaces at election time. Um, my own position on that is if it surfaces at election time, it means that we do have a race problem. Um, so it's the willingness to begin, first of all, by acknowledging that we do have a race problem. Um, the willingness to engage in a conversation around how we got here. But more importantly, what can we do as we look towards the future? What are the lessons and the strategies that we can give our children? Um, and I say our children because you know, when we think of our parents, when we think of our grandparents, um, you know, they're more or less set in their ways. The children, to me, represent our greatest hope for this transformation that we want to see. Um, and so that's why, you know, I want us to be able to bring children into this conversation. So it's about what are the strategies we can give our children or young people um, to begin to um, address and, as I say, disrupt this narrative around race and, and the superiority of one racial group over another. Oh <clears throat> it's really lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I was really thinking about what I would speak about and, and um, how I would like to go forward in this um, circle is not to talk about I mean, I know where I came from. Everybody knows I came from Guyana. I came from a rich culture. I'm a fifth or sixth generation East Indian um, from Bihar <coughs> and part Nepalese. Um, we have a lot of interact. We had a lot of interactions about five, six generations ago between Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, and so on. And um, Today, of course, you know, um, we're English speaking. Um, many of us in our, um, at my age and so, we've lost our language. We can't even speak Hindi, really. These are some of the things that the treasures, not just um, how we dance or costume ourselves, but um, the language, we've lost the language. And I think that's really a, a big thing that um, we, we, a part of us that's lost, right? And I think, but we could still go forward with new generations, you know, instead of them doing mathematics again, you know, which they do in school for so many hours, we could just get them involved in more things that are historical, artistic things like this, where um, young people are intergenerational alike, much more than just young people, where we can, you know, learn and teach and, you know, pass on, you know, also energetically, right, the heart. Let's say the the hit the heart our hearts right could could come together, and um, I'm very excited about that. And I really don't want to talk too much about this, but I would just like to read this, which was written by my mother, um, Rajkumari Singh, and Par Aji is great great grandmother. Par Aji, my great great grandmother. In my dreams, I visualize thy dark eyes peering to penetrate the misty haze veiling the coast of Guyana. Knewest thou then it was to land far flung from home thy bark the seas had skimmed bearing thee 
thy kismet to fulfill of sweat and toil. Paraji, did bangled ankles well thy sea legs bear, while sahib's gaze, thy exotic gazelle beauty of face and form envelop? If later thy chastity he violated, tis not, tis no shame to thee if man turned brute, a lotus soul defiles. Paraji, if thou could see thou offspring steeped in thy philosophy to bend before the tempest's blasts. Thank you so much. Farlin? Yeah, that, that was beautiful. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, well, thank you, Globespan, Diane, for having me on this very important topic. Um, I, I think I should begin by s acknowledging Alex's proposal that uh, we need to confront this very important um, topic, which is race and racism. Uh, I think it's one of the thing, one of the uh, troubling things about about my own experience growing up in Guyana is, well, first, not being aware of uh, exactly what racism uh, truly means, and I say this because from a very young age. Um, my parents, we moved to several uh, towns and villages, and it was a very mixed community. It wasn't, uh, a, you know, one predominant ethnic group uh, that populated uh, the community. And there are several communities and villages in Guyana that you can go and see this sort of diversity uh, in the community. And I think that's very important to, uh, to, to, to be a part of such a community, to uh, to, to truly grasp what it means to uh, be part of uh, a, an, an inclusive and, and diverse society. Uh, but when we, m we move several times, and uh, when we move to certain um, communities and villages, which did have uh, concentrated ethnic groups, predominantly uh, you would see uh, Indo-Guyanese, or predominantly you would see Afro-Guyanese, uh, that's when things started to change. My perspective tar started to change, and uh, what what uh, what I'm in the midst of, and uh, that was largely fueled by what my neighbors, relatives, friends, and family, uh, what they saw and what they related to me at a very young age. Um, now I'm not pure uh, Indo-Guyanese. I don't have a pure Indo-Guyanese heritage. My Mom's side has a, can, can probably claim that. Uh, my father's side, he's, he's a mixed individual, but his father was, um, uh, well, he's still alive. He's uh, Portuguese, European heritage. My grandma being uh, a mixed uh, individual, um, half, I guess half Amerindian, half <laughs> Indo-Guyanese. But it's very interesting, uh, the, the, the mixture of my, um, my own family and um, being in the communities that I described initially, uh, that I had no perception, no conception actually, of, of what racism means or what difference means. Uh, and I think as I age, and I, I, I reach my late teens, having graduated from high school and becoming more aware of the political reality uh, of Guyana, I think that's when this ideology of racism uh, really got to me and st I started to see my society very differently. Um, of course, I'm sure you know many of you listening uh, would know what I'm talking about, uh, especially when it comes to politics. Um, and I hope we eventually get to explore this dimension, the political dimension of uh, racism because I think that's that's the dimension that I somehow fixated myself to try to understand the roots, the causes, why is it continuing uh, in such a very 
um, catastrophic level. I, I, it's and sometimes it's very worrying to me because it impacts how I relate with my uh, friends who are of a particular race or racial identity or who belong to a particular ethnic group and um, it also affects how they see me uh, especially when I have characteristics that might not um, be considered to be uh, likable uh, within their <laughs> ethnic group or racial space and uh, so there, on the one hand there's the group identity uh, aspect to, to, to racism that I'm, I'm very interested in and on the other hand there's the aspect of how do we get beyond that how do we um, reach a level of equality and um, even equity economic equity uh, if, if we're going to look forward to a, a prosperous transformative Guyana so that's the portion that I hope to um, contribute in this segment Thank you, Ferlin. Thank you very much, Ferlin. Um, Preeta, Alexis, um, thank you very much, Diane, for having me on this um, conversation and to Globespan 24-7 to be here as well. I'm particularly concerned about the issue of race in Guyana. How, as a social construct, it has contributed to the destabilization um, and undermine the good qualities that exists in all of us. Um, Priya, you talked about it. Alexis, you talked about it. That in Guyana, for example, there is that we only hear about race when elections comes up. But during, but within, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the remaining four and a half years, it lies dormant. People get along. People people interact. People share foods. They share weddings. They share music. They share dress. They enjoy each other's company. But then comes election and the divisions start to manifest. They start to be played upon. Let's remember, go back to the 2015 election, when certain members of one party were going to whim village and stirring up Appenjat and race issues. And we, we can remember that there was rioting in Linden and several people were killed on the on the Wisma Bridge, okay. But Alexis, you made a, an interesting allusion just now when you talked about that it, that racism only surfaces around elections to divide, because for the four and a half years people were getting along. It lay there dormant. It lay there, maybe festering, but at the same time accommodating. But consider the origins of racism. And this is where I am particularly interested in, is the origins of how racism has played into Guyana culture and politics, and at the same time contributed compoundingly to affect the mental health of both blacks and Indians in Guyana. And I, wanna, I want, if we have the opportunity, to talk about the historical origins of that, of where racism came to be a factor in Guyana where it is a real, livable, real, actual thing that happens. And we talked on one of our conversations before this about where do we see ourselves going, where does Guyana see itself going in the future, in the 21st century, with a lot of younger people, millennials. And I think what we need to do, and you know, we have the saying in Guyana, well, not just in Ghana, but um, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But I actually do believe that changing the language, changing the conversation, we can help all the Guyanese to understand with information and education how they came to be believing some of the things that they do. And then the younger generation will be able to say, well, all right, I understand where they're coming from. I understand the historical context. But this is not my reality today. And I need to forge a new reality that is more inclusive and embracing. I want to thank you so much because that leads into what um, I wanted to bring up and correct that um, earlier before we um, started this conversation today, we did have a conversation ourselves. Um, I either had individual conversations with you all or, or we had a group conversation. 
So, um, but before I, I jump to that part, I want to remind our view viewers tuning in. We have telephone numbers as we're going to make this um, uh, conversation today interactive. I'd like to see this more interactive than um, our other programs. So even though you're not in audience, uh, please use the USA number for those um, within the United States, 718-555-32990. Devin, can we hit up the numbers? Canada, 647-557-6200. Guyana, 225-9054. Trinidad, 653-9195. So you should be able to see the uh, numbers um, scrolling on our screen. So if you see the numbers, please give us a call. Be part of this conversation. So if you had, didn't have an opportunity to be here in audience, let's have that conversation and expand it in a manner of where we can make, make it a teachable moment and increase the knowledge um, and grow what the knowledge of our ancestors have taught us. And again, Globespan 24-7 reminder, uh, we will be moving, today's our, our last Saturday, um, running the program on Saturday. Next Saturday, next Sunday, we'll be moving um, Sunday the 19th, um, starting at 12.30. So um, on that note, so again, Anton, thank you so much. And based on the conversations we've had, so one of the questions I want to ask, and um, Richard, who is in our audience, Richard saying, Richard um, sent me a really good article by Rajiv Mahabir. And he had posed something in, in the article that I want to um, present to you all. And let's see how we can create that dialogue in here, addressing what you said, Anton, going back to that part. Has the legacy of our ancestors um, uh, erased, um, erased uh, um, like for Indians coming in, the Indian Arrival Day, or um, you know, Emancipation Day, because we just had Indian Arrival Day, um, uh, May 5th, right? Um, Emancipation Day is August 1st. So if we're looking back historically on where we came from, um, has the legacy that we've experienced erased some of that? And, you know, actually with celebrating, um, you know, these major events? I, I, I think, uh, well, that's yeah. that's right. anyone? I, I think that, um, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I think that um, the um, the clique the cliqueish um, uh, history that we have between races, you know, especially um, many of our uh, people um, lived on plantations and were isolated. Actually, so you know, a lot of them didn't have a lot of African people there and other um, you know uh, Portuguese or any other race on. As is the white man who was the overseer, right? Uh, but the thing is, is that we have broke down many, many barriers in Guyana um, against this. And I meet a lot of my um, nieces and nephews, some of them great nieces and nephews, and they are really cool with that, you know. And they have friends who are multicultural, mul um, multiracial, and they get along very well together. You know, there are times within my own family, I, there was an incident where. Um, um, my sister-in-law did not want her son to marry a mixed man, right? Yeah. And um, she didn't, and she married an Indian boy, right? And she has, has twins now. It's, it's all happening now. And um, she can't stand her husband, and, you know, he's just not... It's, is it, are we looking for the right race or the right person? You know, that's really the, the personal question that we need to put out there too th th because we have feelings and you know we all we all have a heart so we all have emotions and we got to use our emotions um to to bring us closer together and to really um be real about it yeah um anton how about you since you uh, raised this i know um sometimes i should probably keep quiet right <laughs> um When I was talking just now during my introduction, one of the things that speaks to our ancestors' influence on our thought processes today and how we deal with race comes from the perspective of the colonialists. The British process of divide and conquer. 
that it is through separating and pitting one race against the other where it is it is making one race or one set of people seem more superior and, and the other inferior that we begin to destabilize and undermine the very existence of each person the very value so consider this that for the blacks who were brought from Africa they were shipped as cargo they were shipped as property the Indians were brought under you know under fraud um, false pretenses they were brought as indentured laborers with a promise that they would be repatriated with an X, with X number amount of money but in the process the British had no intentions of really honoring the value or seeing the value of of the Indians and the blacks as humans mm -hmm. they saw them as just products for labor yeah. but what is interesting is that today we still perpetuate that colonialism mm -hmm. because when we talk about racial divisions in Guyana we are still perpetuating the the the, divis the divisiveness that the British and the Dutch before the British set up and and use as a means of control um, I think what we need to do talk about and we talked about this on one of our calls is that going forward we talked about the construct of who is his who writes history so yes we've got Rajiv who is a dear friend of mine we've also got Gayatri Bahadur who's written about um, Indians coming to Guyana but we've we we've had Walter Rodney we've had Eric Williams from Trinidad we've had President Granger right now who's a historian who's written about history in Guyana but each historian writes from the perspective of their own race through that lens and the history books that we've had in Guyana are often written and published in England the history books that I learned back in back in high school were written and published in England so who edited those books let's take for example that in the United States right now it is being revealed that the Bible there were two versions of the Bible one version of the Bible that, that was for the whites and another version of the Bible that was used for the blacks and in that version of the Bible passages and scripture was removed that would have encouraged or given the black slaves opportunities to rise up and rebel so what is to say then that the history books that we have today or that we were exposed to as children in schools were written in such a way to keep to continue to keep us down uh, yeah I think I'm gonna so pick up on that and <laughs> But um, no, it's not a rejection of what you said. I actually agree with uh, most of it. The only part that I oh sorry about that. <laughs> the only part that I yeah the only part that I have uh, uh, an issue with when it comes to the history books. And you rightfully said that we have many Guyanese historians and authors who have written terrific works. I've explored some myself, and. Um, uh, uh, you know, politicians and uh, independent uh, historians or even academics who become politicians. Um, one of the, the interesting thing about history is that it, it you know, it's supposed to tell us a, a unified, a unifying narrative that uh, is supposed to be derived from a collective series of perspectives. And uh, that collective series of perspectives should cooperate each other, not necessarily collaborate. Uh, and that's where your concern, uh, I believe, comes in. Because when you have, let's say, uh, several uh, Indo-Guyanese writing, writing a particular segment of uh, Guyanese history, uh, there you might get this, uh, this feeling, and I guess it's based on the sentimental feeling that you get from reading their work, that there's a sort of collaboration uh, in effect. And it's, uh, it's sort of prejudice. It's sort of uh, filtered. You don't really get the emphasis or the emotional emphasis as you would, s let's say, read from an uh, Afro-Guyanese author such as Walter Rodney, who's very passionate in his literature, uh, that speaks on behalf of uh, of, of Afro-Guyanese 
uh, in society and uh, before the society was even a society. Um, uh, so and we're talking about plantation days. And um, so that much I get. I think we still have to be careful how we, how we, how we construct that, uh, that narrative of filtered history though. I think it's really and truly a collective effort to, 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 to make that sort of um, uh, uh, distinction between good history, bad history, prejudice history, or a non-prejudice -preju uh, history. And, um, but we can only do it collectively, where you bring one part of the history, and I'll bring one part of the history, and we compare and contrast. Uh, however, one thing I want to come back to, uh, uh, which was raised, uh, I think it was a, a matter of generations, uh, the older generation having a very strident, um, almost staunch-like uh, uh, belief about what happened in the past, uh, you know, and a lot of them who've lived through that past. Uh, and I, I'm going to just say it out and confront it, like uh, specifically the Bornham uh, era, uh, the Forrest Bornham, who was the former president of Guyana uh, for several years, almost th three decades. I hear a lot of stories about those times, and I think, well, naturally being is because you know th that's the generation that I'm confronted with that's the generation that I, l I live with uh, people who came directly from that generation and uh, the, 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 the feeling that you get when people relate about that particular uh, moment in, in Guyanese history political history uh, is it can be very dark it could be very brutish and it could also be very Divis uh, divisive and I think it's the latter part that I'm more concerned with because you know history as it is it'll tell us whether cruelty really happened uh, you, you know you have your records and historical records that you can survey but it's the divisiveness that I'm more bothered by because what the older generation typically wants to do is impose that divisive this, uh, divisive rhetoric onto the present and I think there's there should be an important distinction between what happened in the past and what is actually happening right now. Uh, I mean, if you look at the 2015 campaign uh, uh, leading up to the coalition government winning the, the elections, President Granger was accused of um, being just like Burnham, <laughs> right? And he publicly declared that he's not Burnham. And uh, but you know it's the sort of rhetoric that you get that has a deeper ethnic racialized aspect to it it's not just Forbes Burnham the person it's also Forbes Burnham the afro guyanese who led government for uh, approximately uh, almost three decades but uh, under very um very some would describe it as dark circumstances but nevertheless, it was very trying circumstances. Um, uh, so I think there's a generational discrepancy. The young generation, the old generation. The young generation wants to move on, people like myself, but not necessarily move on to say we neglect the past, but to say that old generation, what can we learn from you guys so that we don't make the mistakes that you did, that you committed to? So I guess that, that's what I wanted to share in that regard. And Alexis? So if I could maybe start with uh, the last point you made, Ferlin, which is about um, the older generation trying to pass that divisiveness on to us. Um, I think it's really what is central to this conversation. You know, I have come to believe through um, my work in um, teaching about and, and training people about how to unlearn racism or how to disrupt racism is first of all to begin to understand because you know you have to contextualize things and the context in which we operated then and the context in which we operate now has to be considered and the truth of the matter is that this when we talk about Guyana we talk about a nation that was birthed from colonialism. Colonialism itself is based on this construct of race. 
yes, race is a social construct, but it's a construct that has been weaponized. And it has been used, as we have seen, um, pre-1966, to divide communities. And I think it's interesting that usually when we talk about race in Guyana, we talk about the two main ethnic groups. Um, but the truth of the matter is that racism operates at every level of our society. And I like to say that maybe our pathology as a country is that race is the prism through which we see every single thing, through which all of our relationships are constructed. So if you look at our political institutions, our political parties, you look at our you know, socio-economic um, um, issues, if you look at our socio-cultural issues, all of these things are affected by race. Now, if, we, if this nation was birthed from colonialism, um, and then your colonial masters left, and Guyanese assumed leadership of this nation, what was done to change the structures that were put in place to help the plantations and to help the colonial powers to, to um, be able to function. So what changed when we moved into independence? What changed was that we assumed leadership of a country, but did we do anything to dismantle the structures that were already in place that has contributed to the problems that we continue to see today? And so this is where this whole uh, argument about systemic racism has to start. That unless we dismantle the structures that continue to give rise to the, the problems that we're seeing on the ground, then it's really going to be hard to make changes. And I also want to say that, you know, when I enter into this conversation on race, I talk about two things. I talk about personal prejudices because we all have them. Um, and I also talk about structural racism or, sy or systemic racism. So that we have to talk about both of these things. Because, because very often, people with personal prejudices move into spaces where they acquire power, and then what happens? That racism becomes systemic. It, it continues to be weaponized. And so these are the things that we have to pay attention to. That's why I think that you know, I want to be able to change the generation that came before us. But I feel in some ways that the damage has already been done and that our only hope really is to begin to do this work with young people. And I was happy when you said that, you know, yes. that when you talk to your younger family, these are people who are willing to see beyond all of the, the characteristics that have been used to separate us in the past. So it's about skin color, it's about hair texture. But having said that, I also want to acknowledge that what still continues to happen is that in many homes, people are having conversations about not bringing certain people into the family. <laughs> you know, I mean, right now you have people who are saying to their parents, who are saying to their children, don't bring this kind of man into this family because or don't bring this kind of woman into the family because. So, you know, as much as we want to say that, there's, that we've had some changes, and I agree that, you know, we've had some changes, there is still a lot of work that remains to be done. And that if we don't begin to do the work of helping people to see how their own personal prejudices um, impact how they relate with people of other groups, then, you know, we're going to be doing this dance for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just add something. You know, uh, one of the important things that, um, I, in New York at least, um, I, I've seen bring um, Guyanese of different ethnic uh, communities is in Brooklyn, 
when um, you know the Caribbean organizations have a party or they have a kwekwe or they do something and you know but not um, the problem is is that the information is not being trickled down to the to the to the um, villages let's say Richmond Hill Bronx right I mean um, the new generation um, her gen her generation definitely his generation I mean they don't they are not dealing with this stuff right <laughs> I mean we've lived it you know we've we've uh, we've been through been through a lot of hurt all the way around and we're still carrying that right and I'm say reading this poem by my mother about um, our grandmother that came from India and then you know there's another little two more be before it closes I'll, I'll, I'll read it what happens after that you know what happens when you're on the plantation both for Africans and Indians because up until yesterday they were still raping the white men were still raping Indian women and black women and vice you know things like this so um, it's um, and then of course you know um, they just left the country when it hit the fan right they could just fly out to you know Portugal or wherever they came from China and so on right Canada <laughs> but the thing is we're still here and even now that we're here in New York and we're creating and we're creating little Guyana big Guyana medium Guyana you know we're we're still very Guyanese culturally um, you know, with food, we're we're very Guyanese. We're very gracious. We were we were taught in schools to be gracious. We used to wear socks and shoes and things like this, a yeah. little tie and a hat and <laughs> so on. So we understand order, and we all could come to order, and we are in order. That's all I've got to say. I think we have a question coming in, um, Devin. Yes. Yes, we have. Caller, some you can go ahead. Devin. We have some comments from online. Um, on Facebook, Everton Tanner says, "Race hate is taught from home." It's a cultural thing and false pride. Bantu Babu says, such an important topic. Thanks, Diane, for this topic. From YouTube, we have Joy Agnes who says, I'm loving this topic. I wish that one day we can be one. And Delight says, in response to that, a good wish. Okay. All right, thank you so much for um, the comments coming in. We appreciate that. And again, just a reminder, uh, we're moving uh, next, next week to Sundays, starting at 12.30. So make sure you um, keep your dial tuned in. So Anton, oh, okay, no, I'm sorry, Frelin. I, I just wanted yes. to briefly say that the, the user who said, I wish w one day we can be one. That's a very interesting uh, sentiment because when I read the history books, I look, I look at the period um, as Alex has described, the pre-1966 era, uh, pre-independence. Um, is this working? Yeah, I see a, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting segment in in our history, uh, where the politics is concerned. And um, I don't know how many of you know, but the the history of the, the well, arguably the, the the most popular political party in Guyana, the, the People's Progressive Party, now Civic. Uh, I mean, back back in uh, the early 1950s, the the People's Progressive Party was a political party founded by not just one individual, but two individuals, Forbes Barnum and Chetty Jagan. And the interesting thing about this, uh, and it's very symbolic to me as well as 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 I internalize it, is that here we have a period before independence where we were unified under one cause and that cause was ultimately to overcome imperialism british imperialism specifically there was no racialized politics this there was no you know you black you coolie or anything like that i don't see any trace of that in the history books i don't see any trace of it even in the books produced by uh the british statesmen they never describe um an like an ethnic uh, dispute that we have manifested today and uh, but what we saw was uh, you know an afro Guyanese and Indo Guyanese the two majoritarian uh, ethnic groups coming together joining forces to ultimately defeat the, the, the well I would describe them as the, the former <laughs> right um, and then things just fell apart after this period and it fell apart because 
I don't think it fell apart because of uh, race, particularly. I actually think it fell apart because of, an, you know, merely an ideological dispute between uh, Burnham and and Jagan, and that's it. And um, however, I think that I'm not gonna, you know, lay blame on uh, either of the two founding fathers of the nation, uh, but I'm gonna just say that. I think part of the blame, at least, uh, should be laid on them uh, with respect to how their politics unfolded thereon. And um, you know, when when I look at the the People's Progressive Party today, and I look at the uh, People's National Congress today, uh, both political parties are still ethnic centric, largely the case. And this is something that they do not acknowledge. They do not accept that we are ethnically uh, segregated from each other, right? And I think the politics is what really fuels and plays into the momentum of, of racism in Guyana and why it it is very stubborn to combat because we have political leaders who are not acknowledging the obvious. The elephant in the room is there is clear racial seg segregation in your political parties and you need to do something about it and this brings me back i'm going to just make this very brief it brings me back to the uh introduction of proportional representation which is the political model that Ghana's uh democracy is framed under and the the purpose of that model is to ensure that each member of society each group each individual have the opportunity in terms of ideology or ethnic interests or cultural interests to be part of the political um, uh, dimension. They all have a contributory um, aspect or role to play uh, in this proportional representation. However, what we saw was the contrary. We saw a concentration of ethnic groups coalescing, joining forces uh, in isolated uh, political campaigns and that's what we still have largely uh, today despite the coalition government's efforts we still have the uh, the, the PNCR pre being pre predominantly uh, Afro-Guyanese we still have the PPPC predominantly Indo-Guyanese and I think this is a very important component in addressing this uh, this 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 racism that we're talking about. Can I just say something? You know, um, <clears throat> after the uh, 1963, when we had the big riots and the burning of Georgetown and <clears throat> people were throwing bombs into, um, you know, families whose homes were burnt down with uh, like the Abrams with their 13 children, mother and father, and um, all of a sudden it's about communism and, you know, what else, capitalism. But the thing is, is that um, we have never not been able to come together as a nation up to now. People are leaving Barbies every day to come to um, Richmond Hill. They're just leaving the country. So, you know, you really wonder what, what's happening in Guyana? Who, who's, who's and uh, you still got the PNC, you got the PPP. There's no new parties. Where are all the young people with all the PhDs and their master's degrees? I mean, what are they doing to help Guyana? Why must we, we coolie people go da back to Guyana and crawl around there waiting for a you know a grain of rice when uh, we could be lolling off in in, in you know really we really got to think of ourselves and you know the way we speak about Guyana's history is always like some um, textbook right but that's for like white people or you know people foreigners we know the textbook because we know it because we we lived it and we are living it and we are here and we didn't give up our identity we still being coolie and we still being black and we still doing quick and we still doing everything in brooklyn you know anybody get 25 cents they get a flight and they go to guyana it's not they're not going to belgium or russia or czechoslovakia or london right they're going back to guyana to see the mati right all the way around so really it's a it's it's a racial problem that still exists in the country because of the politicians right and it, it's not even about uh, socialism communism or capitalism it's just they need to have two parties why does a country have to have two parties on maybe they'll have to have a king if they didn't have that or something but you know it's so absurd that um the poor people are being 
constantly. You know, those of us who could get out by ship or boat or plane, it, it's great. But mo the majority of people can't. And then the children that come up here, as soon as they get over here, be, be, you know, before they express, they want to just throw away that identity. They don't want to, they don't identify. And bring your children to uh, Madrasi for the puja. You know what I'm saying? In Burbies. So that's really about what's, what's our wealth. Uh, but but the diaspora has an equal role to play as well. You have like well over five hundred, seven hundred thousand Guyanese abroad, who who are in, indeed digging into the doubles in Brooklyn and enjoying the quick way in Brooklyn, yeah, Brooklyn, right? What about Guyana? Exactly. What what about Guyana? Where they came from? The diaspora has an equal role to play, and this is why I, I only moved here what three years ago, uh, and uh, uh, it's. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. all races, mm -hmm. they just want to leave the country, right? And what's happening is all these retired doctors and, and you know, people with money, they're going down and buying up the forest in Guyana, building ranches and raising cows and doing things, and coming back here to do the doctorate, right? So, you know, you need to go and speak to all these business people in the avenue and find out what what are they doing? What what are they doing here? What are they doing for Guyana? All the Kuli people, all the black people coming in to see them, right? So they're getting everything, mm -hmm. but they're not. What's what is Guyana getting? They're not getting any of the. Of so, of so you're not disagreeing that the diaspora has an equal role to play. That the I, in that the diaspora. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, I, there are a lot of people I know here who are doing that, right. including myself. Um, I use that. I, I run. I run an. Um, I run an arts organization. I'm a writer. I'm a playwright. I'm a dramatist. I'm a community member. I would take this little girl who never made a step, and I would turn her into a dancer. But the point is, is our culture, keeping our cultural things alive, our history, our this. Whether you're African, whether you're Chinese, this and that and the other, you know. So it's really about holding on to the history and if it wasn't written by African slaves who couldn't write or Kuli people who couldn't write, we are the ones that have to write it now. All right. In the interest of time, let's just, because um, we're going to have to wrap up shortly. So let's just go to Alexis and then uh, Anton. And then I want to um, catch Richard singing in our audience because um, he had uh, made some great points in our conversation that we had as a group. Uh, Alexis. So there are a number of things to yeah. Sorry, there are a number of things that I would probably want to respond to, but time doesn't permit me to do that. But I want to say two things. One, um, that it is about communism, it is about capitalism, and it is about socialism. Um, two, I want to say that when people leave Guyana and they move to other spaces, we see that they take the divisions with them. Look at where people live in this U.S. You have enclaves in, in the Bronx and, and in Richmond Hill and in Brooklyn. And, and in Brooklyn. They're taking the division with them. I know, yeah. So that to me really says that, you know, I think in some ways we, we give lip service to this notion that we don't have a, a race problem and, and there's a bit of and that we're being disingenuous when we say that because we really do have a race problem. Those divisions are real. We see it in our politics. We see it in our trade unions. We see it in um, the places where people work, in the occupations that certain groups of people take up. We see it in what happens when people leave Guyana, where they choose to settle. You know, all of those things really are informed by the fact that we are mired in, in, in all kinds of racial problems. Would you say that it's a natural instinct to do that? You know, among species? <laughs> um, so that's a... Let, a let me say the question, ask the question. Would you say that that's a natural instinct among species to sort of... Um, you know, get, um, be in a barn together? So that's a, a conversation that requires more time, and I know that no, <laughs> we have to... That it's an issue, meaning in terms of, of cultural... And so I don't want to say no, and I don't want to say yes, because I would really like to be able to elaborate. Okay. Um, but okay. I know that... You, you did highlight that we are prejudicial by nature, but, yeah. you know, that's a discourse by itself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 
I just want to say one little thing. <laughs> I don't, I, I mean, I understand because um, I've been there. I'm here too and I'm there. Um, I perform with some of the greatest artists from gay, from the Caribbean in Brooklyn, Ron Bob Semple and them. By the way, he has a movie out. And, um, you know, this is the interaction. I think working with uh, Africans and, you know, um, other people in, in dance forms, art forms and so on, I feel really empowered. You know, I feel I can walk forward alone into the sea. I don't need anyone behind me because I've got the bundle, you know. And um, that's something that I try to pass on to my students and, and all the little ones to my family. It was handed down to us in that way. It's yours. The earth is our richness. Thank you. All right. Let's, um, uh, again, I, I so apologize to our viewers tuning in. And, okay. And, um... So let's just get, uh, engage our audience here also. Richard, I know part of the conversation that you had with, with us. Richard, Richard, yeah. yes. Can you, um, can you mention, because you, you also had um, touched on even the article that you shared with me, with Rajiv, um, and you mentioned something about the psychosocial impact of the post-colonialism. Can you um, elaborate on that? Yes, sure. Uh, what I love about the article, uh, I think it draws a lot of parallel with Guyana. Where we came from, and you guys did a very good job of illustrating that. So, because of the interest of time, I'm just going to hit on one aspect of it. The globalization, what we are facing now, comes from our past. The colonialism, the, the apparatus for colonialism still do exist in today and what is happening today in Guyana as you, you guys rightfully mentioned and it is such a complex thing because there's not a lot of research that has been done in my opinion and, and following this topic so we are not able to identify exactly what are the key indicator or the key primary indicator factors that contribute to the state of our country? Well, you guys mention a lot. So, in, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say to you guys, you guys are doing a very good job in having this courageous conversation. And it's going to take more than one episode. And you guys are bringing the factors and the instruments that are pulling or plucking out from our history where we were, where we are, and where we need to go. Colonel West said the condition, I, oh, the condition, um, I can't remember the exact phrase, but what Colonel West actually said as an American philosopher is that the condition for the suffering is, is all about giving the person the opportunity to express their suffering and to get that out from here. And that's what you guys are basically doing. And we in the audience here and also through YouTube and so forth are getting a touch and a feel of that because we are going back into our own personal history and identifying, as you mentioned, I would love to hear you spoke more about the mental health aspect because that's an area that I am, I love and that's something that I'm very passionate about. And one thing that I would say, well, actually is a question I would like to ask you guys because of the interest of time is when, based on all your conversation here, how can we use the Me Too movement that has transcend from what the Me Too movement actually originally began in 2006 mm -hmm. to address the topic that you guys are discussing? I have many questions, but I'll just try to basically ask that one. And if time permit me, there's another one. Well, Alexis, I love what you said. The construct of what the colonial masters and the empire has put in place that is a conversation I would love to explore and hope that the panel can explore later on because it's a very important one that leads back to the construct of what you're saying, Antoine, in terms of the mental health construct. So what I'm trying to say is there are parts of your, all of you guys' conversation that is bringing together an image or a canvas of a picture that is becoming very vivid and continue to do what you're doing. Dialogue, discussion, and continue to do that. So just to repeat back, the Me Too movement, how can the Me Too movement affect change with regards to the topic that we're discussing in Guyana and what is it that we need to do to have the Me Too movement a part of this discussion? Why don't we pass that to um, Anton? Oh. Um, 
Thank you very much for that question. And then um, after Anton, uh, let's jump to one of someone from our studio audience who had a question. I apologize. You can go. Thank you for, uh, again for that question. I think appropriating the Me Too movement or the Me Too hashtag and applying that to the Guyanese context, we can probably even change it to say um, <laughs> Me Too <laughs> are, are, are I too am a victim of colonialism. And because one of the things we talked about when that mm. comes up consistently is how colonialism has affected us. Um, and just to jump back to a couple of points that, that came up that some of you guys were talking about is to consider that for assimilation and adaptation for survival that each of the racial demographics in Guyana conformed to the white um, standard. Mm -hmm. So consequently, even by our sim simple use of good morning and good evening, our simple use of the clothes and the way we dress, so how many of us still have good clothes that we don't wear except on special occasions because when we go out, we want to represent and show we are the best. Because ultimately we wanted to be able to impress the white owners, the white in superior, in superior positions, because we want to be able to secure better economic prospects and futures for ourselves and for our children. Consider, back in the days of after slavery, in Victoria Village or Buxton or Belfield, how many blacks changed their names to suit the plantation owner or the plantation themselves? Yeah. How many Indians sacrificed and sublimated, suppressed their religious belief to become Christian, to go to a Catholic school so they can get the education to be able to rise up? And I'm glad you made mention about how many Indians and people are leaving Guyana because that also comes with a form of displacement or disassociative pl flight. I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be here. I was brought here to labor. I was lied to and I've, I've been forced to remain here, but I don't really want to be here. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about mental health and again about suicidal ideation, in 2014, Guyana had one of the highest rates of suicides in the world at 44% of the, of the population. But watch this. Interestingly, in Guyana, disproportionately there were more women who were taking their lives than men. And disproportionately, the suicides were concentrated among the Indians more than the blacks. So there has already been built into the Indians by generation, I don't want to be here. There is no reason for me to continue to remain here. I need to leave. And if I can't leave by jumping on a flight from, from and I'm still going to call it to Mary, <laughs> okay? If I'm going to jump on a flight, then I am, I am confined to staying here. I am, I am forced to remain here. And the only way out is some Malaysian or some, or some carbon pills. Could I say one little thing to, to answer? Sure. You know, it's true that um, we have to be patient also, but, but, but you know, we are ju have so our life lifetime is so just only so short, but um, I do see changes. But my nieces and nephews, which is now the next generation, they have no interest in Hinduism. They have no interest in Islam, right? But they're all marching out. It all these they're they're all Hindus come from Hindu families, and. Um, but they all became Christians. Now, f from a Hindu perspective, that's a huge loss, right? If all your nieces and nephews are embr have embraced Christianity, you know? We used to have, thir my grandmother had 30, my grandmother had 30 grandchildren, right? 30 grandchildren. And in our generation, we hardly have three, okay? And it's eight children my mother had. I just want to show you where the population is. It's not here either. Yeah. Uh, we have a studio audience that I believe have a comment or a statement, oh, yeah. uh, a question. Yeah, I'm Ban Matira. Hi, Ban Matira. And what I like to say is that whereas uh, we've heard like um, concepts, um, we've looked at history of slavery, um, 
of racism, where it's coming from, or probably. Can you hold the mic a little closer, please? Yes, we've heard about, um, we've listened to the panelists. And what I've not heard so much of is, is where do we go from there? Some of the um, solutions or some of those things. And I grew up in Guyana many moons ago. And I actually went to, a, I'm from an Indian community mostly, 99% when I grew up. And I went to church in Golden Grove. So I was forced to interact with people of another ethnic group. Mm -hmm. But what was good about um, interacting is that my father had neighbors that he grew up with, and when they passed through the street, they would say, he would call them neighbor. Neighbor, come and sit, and because they grew up as boys mm -hmm. together. And then we went to a, a black church, and my chacha said to him, why are you letting your daughter go into a black church? And my father had to face those kinds of opposition, but because we were so many kids in the home and we went. My father saw us living, you know, a good life and he did not object to it. But we ourselves had to face interacting with students in Golden Grove, students in high school. Um, so we learned how to, and then I went to Jamaica and I was, a, um, I'm an ordained Baptist minister. And I was the only Indian pastor, only Indian person in three congregations. I was pastoring and it didn't matter, nobody, well, they saw me as pastor. First they saw me as a woman pastor, and then they saw me as well as an Indian, and then they just saw me as pastor. Because I interacted, and if you're willing to interact with people of another race, and to walk amongst them, and to go to their functions, and to eat, but one thing I realized when I was going to Golden Grove Baptist Church, I never spoke politics with the people, with my sisters and brothers, who were mostly of the other race. And I happened to speak politics to one of them when the coalition was coming into power. And I was part of the coalition movement as well. And when I started to critique the coalition when they were not doing as well as they should, Somebody got mad at me and the person was from Golden Grove Baptist Church of another race. So the other issue we need to maybe think about is that you might be in the same congregation with people of other ethnic group, but you're not talking about issues that affect you and that are like sores there. You don't want to touch it because it's going to cause a lot of pain. And so I'm glad for this conversation and it's the young people and us who have you know, been around older people who will have to move this um, conversation forward because even when I went back to work with government on contract, when I walked into the Ministry of Education, people saw me as an Indian Guyanese and a PPP supporter because Indian means PPP supporter. Mm -hmm. and they, wasn't, they weren't sure how to take me. So when I walked in the office, I said, you know, I am Guyanese, and I'm here for all Guyanese, irrespective of ethnic background, color, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And these are the things we have to confront in the ministries of government, in ministries in Guyana. It's not easy, but you have well, you, you you. to go and work there, you have uh, to go. Thank you, Ban Metvi, so much. <laughs> and I'm glad you raised that point. So we're going to close this now by um, saying, and I'm going to ask each person just, is it okay for just one, mo one minute for each person? Yes. So one minute, guys, right? So I apologize to our view viewers. I know this conversation is so extensive, um, and we can talk so much more about it. Remember, this is only part one. So we will be looking at other parts of uh, this conversation and how we can expand it. And as Banmiti Ban asked, and we all have mentioned um, the way forward. So here's to all um, on our panel. And I'm going to throw this out to you, but again, my apologies in the interest of time. Just keep it um, brief. Uh, we all have had a story to tell. And growing up in Guyana, um, we've seen and heard the stories, whether it's from the history books or our ancestors. So if we had a chance to rewrite those stories, can you tell one thing from a past that you would change? Um, Anton, why don't we start with you? Um, I have to think about that a little carefully. Okay. Um, Ferlin, would you? 
Ja, Proposal. Can, um, I, can I ask to, for you particularly? Sure. Okay. I have, uh, and we, you and I talked about this coming mm -hmm. from a mixed race. I have my eight-year-old niece sitting in the audience right now who is oh. of a mixed race, and I had this conversation. <laughs> she is looking shocked. Um, during her school break, mm -hmm. she was at my home, and um, we had this conversation about, you know, um, she said she's, you know, she's of her black parentage, okay. but her father is Indian. So, um, uh, talk about that. Well, if we had to rewrite the story to teach my eight-year-old niece and other children that might be out there, you know, especially for um, young people coming from a mixed mm -hmm. race, like what what would you rewrite? So, my eight-year-old niece could grow up to be um, a well-rounded adult like you. you know I'm what trying I mean? my best. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a responsibility. Um, I think I, I think during our discussion, I think I said I wouldn't change anything uh, about that history. Of course, you know, there's always the ideal, and the question of whether we can reach the ideal or not is it's a matter up to dispute. But I think there wouldn't even be a conception uh, of an ideal were it not the case that we had a particular history be the way it was, so that we can learn from it, uh, derive lessons from it, and so that we can create a, a very interesting, more progressive uh, future. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't re rewrite Guyanese history. I, I, I wish I had the power to, but I wouldn't rewrite it because of what happened and the consequences that led to those events. But I think those events are really giving us uh, the capacity to show the world on a large scale uh, that we can actually make uh, diversity inclusion work. We can actually set the stage for something as complex uh, to become a matter of just simple yesterday's problem. So, All right, so um, they're telling us we have to wrap up, so I'm going to ask um, Alexis, touching it very briefly, um, Pratia and, and uh, um, Antoine, so we can close off. So I want to say again that the struggle that your niece is facing and the struggle that all people of um, mixed heritage face is that they're forced to choose one race over the other, not by choice, but because of what our society tells them. And so in thinking about the question, what do we do? I don't want to say that we should just focus on education because education alone is not going to solve our problem. Each of us must be intentional in terms of how we talk about people of another race, in terms of what we say to our children, in terms of what we say when people say negative things about people. So it's, you know, your father, um, you know, being forced to respond to people asking why you're sending your children to this church. You know, it's a child forcing to choose between, you know, whether she's Indian or, or whether she's black. So it's, all of us must be intentional in addressing our prejudices and we must be intentional in terms of saying and acting in non-racist ways. All right, thank you, Alexis. Um, let's, let's go to Anton, let's give Anton. And then we'll come back to- I think the- And just close off here. That being able to change something from my past in terms of understanding race is going back to about 1978, I think. Um, actually, no, before, 19, before 1975, um, when there was a referendum between the PPP and the PNC, um, the cup versus the palm, versus the palm tree. And my mother saying to me not to go to the, to the Indian's house today and play because that may not be the best place to go today um, because there was an election there was voting and it was again along racial lines uh, my mother was PNC and the, 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 you know the family across from us was PPP um, and 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 then being able to understand that in different communities like Ferlin perhaps um, I am mixed race and not being accepted by the Indians for being Indian and not being accepted by the blacks for being black. I'm not black enough. So there's still in, in the black family part of me that says I'm still half skull and like a dose, I'm still Indian. Um, and as a child growing up, 
I never could, I never liked sitting with my feet hanging down. I always prefer to cross my legs and I prefer to eat in my hands without even realizing that I had Indian ancestry. Um, and then on the Indian side, I was too black to be Indian. Um, so I never really fit in. And so the question again is going forward, how many young people of mixed race don't find a sense of belonging in either racial grouping, but then now have to create their own. And that sense of not belonging creates another form of mental health destabilization. Just real quick and then we'll just we'll close. I just want to say uh, thank you for this. And um, it's definitely a narrative that needs to continue yeah. those of us who are in the diaspora. But personally, I mean, I feel, I feel so lucky to be born in Guyana and to go to um, the Methodist church, the temple, the masjid, you know, all everything. We just did everything. We went everywhere. And we had aunts who were Christian and we had great aunts who were this and that and we were just there and then we lived on the plantation during the riots um, around Diamond there just to uh, be safe and um, we started to learn how to walk barefoot, pick up cow dung and make dog bottom house and things like this. But you know, that's what we should do with our children, send them out to be to learn and get, get you get in touch with the country. Thank you. All right, I wanna thank our um, our guests. Alexis uh, Stevens for coming from Guyana and taking the time out from her schedule to join us. I appreciate it, Alexis. And Alexis celebrating a, a birthday tomorrow, so I want to wish her a happy birthday. Um, so, and, and it's really wonderful meeting her. Um, Pita, I, I came to your home and had the story and, and getting that experience. Thank you so much for embracing me and, and um, sharing all that knowledge with me. I know you have a wealth <laughs> of knowledge to <laughs> tell us. Ferlin, coming from, I'm not going to say youth perspective, but being the youngest of the group, thank you so much for joining us and bringing that to the forefront. And um, Anton, as always, thank you again. There's so much to this conversation, and we will continue um, on a part two. Date not known yet, but keep in mind, as of next week, we are moving from Saturday to what, folks? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday the 19th, so please tune in. Stay tuned. Um, at 2 p.m., we're coming up with our political segment on, I believe, the CCJ, so stay tuned for that. Um, go ahead. We just have one final comment from an in-house audience member. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And we have a lot of great comments from online, but unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> All right. So again, thank you. Stay tuned for the 2 p.m. segment. <laughs>